Hello. <laughs> okay. Steve, are you going to welcome us or am I? It's all up to me. Well, welcome here on this rainy, foggy, windy day. And I do have to say there's something kind of wonderful to me about being in the atmosphere of river or impacted by the atmosphere of river. I love the sound of the rain on my roof. It's a, a comforting kind of lullaby, especially because we're in the rain. So <laughs> welcome to this warm space, to the Poetry Center. Um, this evening, and I won't give a long welcome, is happening because of incredible support from George and Lindsay Marcus for the creative writing department at San Francisco State University. Um, it's a collaboration between me <laughs> and the Poetry Center and the center. <laughs> Some random person, does it really matter in the scheme of things, <laughs> you know? At this moment, I'm a sort of collection of molecules and cells and all those things talking to me. Um, but, and a collaboration with the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies. Um, it's in support of an ongoing program, Woman, Life, Freedom, throughout the month of March. And Steve will come up later and tell or Francis will come up and share with you the different events. There's something amazing happening on March 16th, music. And I'm not going to try to recount the events that are happening because that is, I'm nervous. <laughs> and maybe that's how I know I'm alive. But we're welcoming, um, let's just start by saying art, poetry, life doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen without community. Welcome Leo and welcome Abu Harman, anthropologist, poet, performance artist, pretty decent cook, <laughs> tea drinker, um, who's here in many ways as an artist, but also because for me, pivotal to any sort of praxis or process of making is the question of who are you talking with, right? And even if we don't know, even if you're alone, you're in conversation with a host of others who've preceded us on this particular plane, those who are walking with us, and those we haven't yet imagined. So, Abu and I are going to sort of have a conversation. We're going to play. We're going to play. But <laughs> play is always a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Play is always a conversation. Welcome, Abu. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Kwame. Thank you for inviting me, hosting me, welcoming me, being my own creative companion. Um, thank you, Poetry Center. And Steve, thank you, and thank you for persisting and insisting and dealing with everything that you know we throw your way. Um, yeah, I'm going to light a candle first, and 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 see um, maybe at the end of the night, Francis can say something also about this night in Iranian life and culture, which is the Tuesday before the new year next week where we have all kinds of things going on with fire. Now, we can't light a bonfire outside on campus, so this is where we are. <laughs> um, but if there's anything you want to burn down. Uh, <laughs> I'll put a lot. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make a list. <laughs> we can start everything with a list. Um, let me let, I, I want to also start by asking everybody for a moment just to get up and stand um, where they are on the ground and feel the ground that they're standing on, the ground that they speak from, that the ground that holds them, if it's solid or liquid or fractured or smooth, doesn't matter. 
and just feel that you are there and then acknowledge where you are from. And if you don't mind, please sit closer to the ground. Just touch. Now feel your breath, knowing that somebody else was there, somebody else is always there. And now sit down where you are feeling comfortable. And we're going to start from there. Feel the traces of the person who was there before you, because there's somebody always there before you on that chair. Feel it maybe it on your legs, in your butt, on your back, in the air, in the particles around you, wherever that trace is left and the light bouncing off. There are three or four mysterious forces without which none of us would be here, without which the universe would have not come together, nothing. So they must be there. They must always have been there, those forces, without which none of us, nothing. Of all the things, the mastodons, the candles, the mascara, the memories, the vibrators, the medications, the cameras, the plants, the cedar wood, the eyes, the crazy eyes, the moon in them, the precision, the bun rings, the fits, the strength of your grip, the smell of horses in your nostril, the question mark in your ears, the labyrinth of silence in your day, the laughter screwed or didn't, the sad thrown back of your heart. Of all these things that made you up, also count some four of trillion, seven hundreds of trillion, and one or two hydrogen filters. To a great extent, you were made up of hydrogen filters. Everyone, I filter, you filter. For a brief period, there was nothing more fundamental in the universe. Now, there are two quarks. No one knows what a quark is or what they're up to or what they might be made up of if they are made up of anything. The way we are made up of photons bound by three or four mysterious forces and dark matter that 13.8 billion years ago came together to make three quarks into particle soup. Quark, 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 <laughs> the seabirds called. Then time slipped by. Nobody saw it coming. But 400,000 years later, protons got together with electrons to make the first atom out of the force of attraction, out of love and a promise they would not be separated even when forced, even at a distance, even as photons, even on a dead cat's whisper, whisker, even in Tibet, even when dust on a butterfly wing, even in storms, floods, fires, eruptions, and ashes even, even in hate at the end, ever, even, never, then gases, then it's a blur. Supernovas, gamma ray bursts, electromagnetic waves, planet, fire, earth, mountains, water, cells, sugar, DNA, bacteria, whales, fish, tree, flowers, pterodactyls, turtles, snakes, DMT, mosquitoes, yellow bees, red cardinals, lions, baboons, Neanderthals, tumors, you and me and nuclear bombs and nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machines. What a different order to walk into. A scale still played out today under the skin, the cosmic goings on, going on. All the beginnings held in that hydrogen proton spinning in your body with the giddiness of those who come out of nowhere, with moment, with charge, with energy, with radiation, with spin, wild but susceptible to suggestion, to influence, unseen, passed down through all of time. This vastness, we feel acutely when we are given two years to live, two years to die, two, 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 two,
two, counted in years, then counted in months, then in days, two hours, two minutes, two, where time that's left and time that's passed are part of the same body of time. The future terminal, the tense of survival, two. Yeah, it comes down to this time, you in it, it beyond you, until you learn how to walk on the other side of time. Three or four forces force us into the we. We had never anticipated, wanted the things because we thought they would make of us a something, some thing that you imagine will give you substance, but the body is not a thing, nothing. The body is an approximation of soul. The body is the soul, or how the soul knows you, knows the particularities of itself. I am shaking for many reasons, too soon to say. What will being come to? What an order there is to is, to conquest and questing, there is time. The magnetic field, 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's, reveals the tumor inside your breast. Magnetic Earth, magnetic field, magnetic body, magnetic machine, lines up your protons, an order necessary for imaging, for the wild has no image, hence wild. This is your body we're talking about. This is our body. All magnetic, nuclear, oscillating, transmitting radio frequencies like there was no tomorrow. This is us, ourselves, behaving this way. This you and this me. This is us and the universe and our forces and charges and fields, our ability to absorb each other and emit signals. This is us below biology. This is you and this is me, amplifying the recognition this is you and this is me. You flip my state, turn my moment. This is you and this is me. You ping me, I ping you. Radio me, radio you. Bump me, bump you. Jolt me, jolt you. Spin me, spin you. You miss me, miss you. Yes, you miss me. Yes, me. Yes, you. Yes, me. Yes, 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 you. This much is science. What is a mammary for? For whom is a mammary, remnant, magnetic, the universe forgetting nothing, for getting nothing, for getting nothing, as clearly as water? Until then, we didn't know the body had so many miracles in it or that we needed so many more. Until then, you didn't know you were a radio, didn't know you could hiss and quack through all these states. You could emit, but you didn't know. God or no God, if we accept physics story of the universe, we also would have to say at least this much. The technology of our body is the technology of the universe. Hydrogen protons whirling in electromagnetic madness. It is fall, everything red and orange across the northeast, the landscape of bruises and biopsies. Calculating the rate of your body's betrayal, the tumor counts time as time is counting you. A tumor is the hollow of hope dug up and sliced and sent over to pathology. A tumor is a bunch of cells declaring independence, mutants in mutiny refusing death. A tumor yields knowledge, gives off data, enters a database, and thus do you come to know your chances if you cut off your left breast. A tumor means wasted time and time not to be wasted. Time passing too slow and time passing too fast, but always passing. Passing with the sound of a shadow, passing through a shadow. The way your eyes suddenly lifted and asked, the way the oncologist looked back, the way you said, I want to see it. The cells multiplied made a tumor. 
my body, its mold. A mold is one thing shaped around another, one matter poured around another, sealed, understanding the parts, figuring the split lines, two bodies wrapped around each other, testing their geometries, seeing how they fit, snug, airtight, breathless, one, the inverse of the other, the heart and its hollow, the blow and its trauma, love and need, the character and its actor, the parent and the child, the shoe in the snow, the shoe out of the snow, the now out of its prior. A mold is the shape of the understanding of a shape, a place to hold something tight, a place from which it must be removed to become again the thing, one more of itself, and also a something else, one more. A tumor means a world is a mold, wraps itself around things, leaf around leaf, glass around glass, cancer around tumor, absence around presence. What is need? Listen to the drafts of desire written in our dailinesses. I think often of Reverend Ike, you can't lose with the stuff I use, as though stuff could provide certainty. What makes waste of us? Believing in somehow is somehow becoming other than what one is. Seeing how, rarely love. Too often we are convinced by what and what if. Nothing, the tumor, a bowl of nothingness. Appearance makes particles unstable, and when they become unstable, they decay. When they decay, we decay. You decay. She decayed. I decay. Because your <coughs> biology, monsieur, is not biology because you are not all life, because half-life, because radiation, because neutrinos, because alpha, beta, gamma, because transmutation, because when you appear, you have been, you become some other thing. Time is unstable. How close to decade is decay? Because an effect will follow. Under the supermoon in the rainforest, the actress crawls inside a mosquito net. Cone of light, swirl of smoke, evanescent tomorrows, mapacho, ikaro, irake. This is you, this is not you, this is an actress. An actress is a body that is both real and imagined, hers but on loan to the character, concrete and conjured. The actresses but also the directors, hers but leos. Not lives, not deaths, a corpse and an image a corpse and a person. In the jungle, it's like that. It's like in the movies. The Chulachaki appears as someone you know, but walking on hoofs. In the jungle, your eyes see things. Your eyes see things when there's nothing to see. The horizon near, thick, wet, the light bends, your eyes cones of dew beating the vine, and beyond it all, in the darkness, all there is, is hiss, radio waves, sky. Supermoon, swirl, cut. On every, surf on every surface, life declares itself, he said. Listen to it. Listen to the 40,000 plant species, 16,000 tree species, 427 mammal, 13,000 bird, 378 reptile, 427 amphibian, 3,000 fish species. Listen to seven million unknown, uncounted, unmeasured species in this corner of the galaxy. Listen to being, make waves, sugar, energy. Listen to the carbon life falls out of. Listen to all the frequencies as they fade. Just listen to life, the healer said, and life listens back. Once you learn to listen carefully to the night of the jungle, the healer said, you hear the Tunchi cry of existence from the birth pang to the death moan. For as many creatures as come to be in that jungle, exactly the same amount end up dying. Now they are dying all the time, now and now and now and now and now and cut. Beth Secor says to pretend you are in a movie when the circumstances are unbearable. And yet what is unbearable? 
This seems so simplistic, my thinking today. What am I avoiding here in this moment? I want to watch the light, to listen to what it offers, to what it adeptly. Let us start by not dying. Everything is in that not. Like when you are born and then you don't die. And so there you are for the next little span of time, not dying. Some must fight to not die, to not be killed, to not be driven into the sea, to not go extinct, to survive. To survive, take another breath, get to the next moment. Sometimes you get to the next moment, whether or not the next moment is what you want to get to. Maybe it's not about what you want anyway, because what your body wants is warmth and sugar and light, but you, you want love and creativity and glory. And regardless, you just keep on not dying from moment to moment until before you know it, you reach that moment when you have to. It's hard to kick some habits, give up some fights. In the middle of not dying in Laughlin, Nevada, I get the call. The hospital tells me you went and they decided to keep you overnight, maybe longer, maybe forever. Laughlin is a casino time t town named after a billionaire who wants to not die. Well, doesn't everybody, he asks, don't you? Everyone asked me that question at the conference on transhumanism held in this desert in this town of neon hallucinations, whiteness staking more claims on the future, technological, eternal, scientists, science buffs, pseudoscience, puffs, Mormons, skins irradiated with a post-nuclear glow, sun lamps, freon, lavender scented Lysol, overly oxygenated air, noble gases, deep fry styrofoam, windless chicken, pigless bacon, hopeless cows, petroleum pump, silicon, lead, blood, Google, denial, Lockheed Martin, rot dripping from America's liver, Life broken up, death canceled by the ka-ching, ka -ching of coins dropping down the tin throat of machines. And what does the seal of sand smell of in Laughlin today? How far is the ocean? What is the smell of bones? On the way home, the railroad tracks and the shield of US 95, road sign extermination into infrastructure. Paving over burials, fracking over the dead, building tumors for the living. How do I travel this drying road before me, after you, and get to call it life? Not the knots that come for the eye. I think I am, that I'm told I am, that I am. And what is a knot of not worth? There is no fighting some things. What is the language of love, the language of loss? There are bones riven with plastics, riven with cuts, curating us out. <laughs> <laughs> is that an edit? <laughs> Cross it out. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that's where you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I am. <laughs> Curating us out of the day, the road paven. Well, now I think I understand things I didn't before about survival, like shoving through to get a seat on the subway before anyone else because your pain was bigger. Or was it? The trains carry so much pain, so many eyes call out pain, Pain, not in the eye of the beholder. Pain, each wagon so full of pain. So many buildings full of pain, tending to the broken monuments to pain. Everywhere, broken limbs and organs, broken lives. All other buildings reminding you that to live, you need to buy. To eat, you need to buy. To rise, you need to buy. To play, you need to buy. To heal, you need to buy. To buy. To dream, you need to buy. Especially to dream. The rush of dreams pouring from the mall that waterfall, ornate, chlorinate, luxury, hangs at the end of every synapse, hanging from every branch a brand, a promise in every pill, every bottle of Patron, 
promises on every posture of pedic, better dreams inside, every canoe, a yacht, every house, a mansion, every ring, a diamond, every self, a celebrity, every mortal, an immortal. Such great dedication to the increased comforts and pleasures of humankind, down to the chemical bonds. And every day, 130 people die from their need to avoid pain by taking too much of a pill designed to do just that. <laughs> Eliminate pain. Die pain. Die. The greatest consumption of goods made for pleasure has become inseparable from the greatest consumption of goods made to kill pain. Imagine all that is out there of fentanyls and F-15s, ketamines and Kalashnikovs, Zoloft and Z9 Blackhawk, the sheer quantity of pain-killing and plane-killing, ensnared. Ensnared is what it feels like to live inside the pharmacon. This is what it feels like to live. What laxative should I take tonight? You want some apples? I boiled apples earlier. You can eat soft apples. When we go for a little stro stroll outside to get fresh air, you say, maybe oxygen makes me nauseous. Maybe oxygen, maybe life. Hospice <clears throat> hands out its brochure of platitudes in the last days, saying, Talk to each other. Make peace. Put things in order. Apologize. Celebrate. Listen. Touch. Say, I love you. I forgive you. I will be okay. You will be okay. Thank you for the art we made. I know it was difficult sometimes working with me. With me too. Yes, with you too. I was so moody. You would scream. Sometimes. And you would break things. Yes, I would. And blame you for not knowing the software. I would blame you too for being sloppy. I am sloppy, but I am happy we were together. Me too. We made good work mostly. Yes, together we made good work. I don't regret any of that. <sighs> no, we couldn't leave each other. Sometimes you hated me. Sometimes you wanted to kill me. You wanted to leave. Sometimes I did, you too. But there was something always stopped it, my cancer. That too, but love. Yes, something, we didn't always get it. Maybe in the future we would have broken up. Maybe now. We don't have, we don't have to, uh, maybe now we don't have to. Please don't cry. Don't cry now. If you cry, I will lose it. I won't. I will make sure I'll take care of you after I die. I'll take care of you after you die too. Make sure Amir sees the film. And Michael too. I will. I have a list. It would be nice to have a healing center. Yes, I know. You had such a good idea, all the different modalities. I have good ideas sometimes. I will do that somehow, a home for healing. But it can never be enough. The problems overspills the bounds of all you can possibly say, because the real problem is not what you haven't said, but all what you can't say ever again after that, and maybe all what you can. There is such tenderness in this dying, in this remembering. If you're lucky in this life, what doesn't kill you, kills you anyway. What doesn't kill you, maims you. What doesn't kill you, kills me. What does your leaving leave behind? Rampant wanting. The dead want just as much as the not yet dead. And what is saying, saying? Ghosts come from there. The wind comes from there. The grass comes from there. The bugs come from there. Water comes from there. Life comes from there. The night sky broke open with snow, <clears throat> and in the morning I washed the body. 
I washed between the toes, traced the clavicle, ran a rivulet across the forehead, behind the ears, wiped the dribbles around the mouth, the lips tight, and tighter the nostrils. I put a finger against the bunion on the left, against the bunion on the right. Water ran off the arms, off the fingers, bony still, off the wrist, twisted still. I flushed the navel, laid a hand on the vagina, palming the belly. The belly bloated, and so bloated the thighs, soft the skin like youth, but taut like death. Stretched like a drum around the scars, so many scars, so many cuts from so many tubes, so many blood draws, incisions, insertions, ideas for improvement. And now the veins shrunk more even, dry, drying, dried, and I want to put the hose in there and fill them again with fresh currents and flows before it is lowered below the skin of the earth waiting for her moonlight, the new food of ancient creatures below the snow crust waiting to welcome her body to squirm through her parts I touched last, Touch them differently, take them in and break them down differently, grind her parts with stones in their gizzard, metabolize her flesh, microorganize her soft tissue, spin her protons, transform her into what she, even she, could not have imagined. For she surely became other things, so many, many things. But who has account of what all she did become, what all she had been? Where does there lead to? Chronicity is such a notion. Tired of time, time out, time's up, time in, time timmering. What are the parts? When the other's gone, the ensuing molecular confusion we call loss. Me in the mirror, seeing a hole in me we call loss. The imprint of your back on the mattress we call loss. You there, not there, maybe there. Maybe they misarranged the universe today and we call it loss. Ontological discombobulation, you can die from it. From not finding things where they're supposed to be, from finding holes where others are meant to be. You can die, you can want to. You can swim out into the ocean because you said to yourself, if I swim, if I swim far enough, I won't be able to swim back home. Then I can be gone forever. Let the hole take me, the water. There are no solidities to get immersed forever, but you don't. The light bends you at the horizon. That self-same body calls you back home to look at the bottle of morphine and think, how much of this do I need to get back to the middle of that ocean? What keeps keeping us here? Maybe loss is the primary nature of the day, is the central feature of a day. Keep keeping on. I know there's no one. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this tree. All right. <laughs> I look around for the voice, small, smoky, squeaking out of a matchbox and wonder if dreams are the only realm where we come to meet you and I on equal footing. When you go see a spirit medium, people ask you if you believe. And I wonder what you have to believe in order to go see a therapist and why people don't ask you that. Why do I cry? Why do I cry in the morning? Why do I cry into my cereal? Why do I cry at night? Why do I cry into my quinoa? Grief rose out of the ocean and returned dropping from the sky. It's where we start, infants crying for that world of water in which we lived before birth, before life five billion years ago, and keep in us the ocean, amniotic, saline, snot, spit, spit, semen, sweat, saliva of time, the human effluvium, the flow we know as life and loss. I cry to survive, ejected from the world of water, alien, landed in the world of oxygen, alien, come from the comforts of darkness, alien, creature of the crust, I cry, alien. I cry proteins, protons, ions, mucin, glucose, lipids, enzyme, Dirt sometimes, sometimes sand in my eyes. In each tear, many pains, other pasts crumbled, other loss coursing through us, each tear dropping, so many other sorrows. 
From the other and separate to the other separate I cry. I cry and taste the other. For the being of water I am not, for the light of the sky I am not, the past I am not, the dead I am not. I cry you present, your condensations curled into my lip, waters of the planet drip, water of your eyes drip. I cry and know my dead are of mist, fog, evaporate, steam, ghosts of water moving between states, without whom there is no cycle of love. The wet portal between others, other realms, here's and theirs, theirs and mine, you, me, visibles, invisibles, I hear you. How are you today? I see you. How are you today? Looking where? Footing what about bunions? What must be disbelieved in seeing the therapist? What do you put away? The ocean travels through the tears out of which we rise. Hesitant tears are the hardest kind. Being of being is all we can be. Water is my will and my way, says the dead poet, tendering the mercies. Do not fear the soft orange glow of human being. Soft. Closure would require that I kill you for good or myself. Orange. Mourning is how I keep you alive in me still and keep me alive too. Glow. Do not fear the soft orange glow of human beings when they're not here. One of the first things colonial rulers, church leaders, and post-colonial secular states did was eliminate local ways of doing death. The cry holds the power of water from which life, from which tears, from which love. With it, we scrub the surface, walk and dance, and harness heat, water, light, and ultraviolet frequencies to remain to appear to each other, to love. It is what keeps keeping us here. Fear the fist. Grateful. Deal with your dead how we say. Who is this we that offers? Lament comes to me in other ways too. The tones of Shia suffering Draped black cloth for they killed Hossein in Karbala. The pain relearned my pain now. Siavash before that, before Hossein, before me, year after year. But now especially, for grief is a time loop. Pain relived and reenacted on the streets now. Chains slapping the back now, the chest now. Razors across the forehead. The beating of the breast till blood. Till the dripping from the liver, from the foot, from the sword. The gash till tears, till pearls in the ocean. Till the daughter of the prophet, till the mother of our master. Till her name in every raindrop. Till her infinite embrace, till her face of sun. Till martyr, till death for the other, for you, for all, for this. Till I am drained of me, my blood at the end, till nothing and nothing more. Till then, yes, I howl, how I howl, I moan, how I moan. Ninety billion humans come and gone so far since humans first stood up and walk to the ends of the world. What are they to me and who? At what remove does my indifference start? What are you to me? Remember the mothers of the plaza refusing the remains of their disappeared? The wound, they said, will not close until everyone, not just mine or me, until everyone, not just us and ours, until everyone, meaning until justice for this wound is not only my wound, and so did the dead echo. Every time someone said their names, they'd shout back, presente. Who hears the dead? Whose dead do you hear calling back? Mm. A sign on the community garden across from Greenwood Cemetery reads, 
not a minute of silence for our dead, but a lifetime of struggle. So many lifetimes of struggle on the red soil of nations, citizens of a wound gaping at a world that does not want to look, screaming in a world that does not want to hear, marching in a world that does not want to be disturbed, where you need a million people and a banner to claim the basics, black lives matter. Until then, until everyone, until black, we live in the white gash across the world's chest, the oceans, the skies, no ship, water, or spacefaring can cross. Until then, mourn to reclaim from this world the arrangement of its absences in the wreckage to find power to reappear. Connect the many dots. Grief writ daily, hourly, moment by moment. Yet you are here. Who are you to me? Are we often deciding rather than feeling. <clears throat> I want to listen, to listen, to linger in what you are saying. We often talk of testimony, testifying <clears throat> to counter the regular test of lying. The absence of the dead is never trivial, neither is their presence announced lightly. Reality can shatter in the way that only reality can shatter. This appearance. Amongst the various things that she did become, I know Leo also became a cockroach or her hydrogen protons did. The proof is too complicated right now. But if we have time, I can show it to you later. But I knew the moment I looked up a cockroach slipped out from behind the Shipibo ceramic of you and danced slowly up to the bed where I was propped up on those pillows, your fortress of pillows, and it tried to climb up the metal nightstand, and I thought, it is so shiny, the nightstand. Can it climb up? But they that are of flesh, mind, the spirit, and I thought, wait, let no man deceive himself but really, are you coming to me? Are you climbing this metal leg to me? Onanias in the Amazon taught us that if any creature appears on your path or in your head, you must not be afraid. You must immediately ask, who are you? And they will either tell you or they will slink away. I have asked this of a dog, a snake, an infected rat, an armed wanderer. I have asked this of trees and shadows on the street. I have asked this of my students. I asked this of myself. I asked this of the cockroach, and she shimmies up to me and dances with her antenna on the other side of time. Is this you? Is this me? The dead are never absent. If we held that thought, this sense, then what? How would we deal with all the traffic? You think we have trouble, given the easy delusions we live with. Notice how they present themselves. I once told someone who asserted that my spirit guide is a spirit guide one of the dead wanted to talk with. I'll tell you the story some other time. <laughs> Where meaning ends, acts of reappearance occur repeatedly 
an event as ordinary as speciation, as birth, a grandfather putting in an appearance in the newborn. Shards of the universe cutting through the mother skin, another sun rising on another fucking day, another damn night descending, another you, another me, another time there was a cockroach. Out of all the nothing, anything is excess, us finding form, needing to first, then needing to drop it. Creation runs in both, and mourning too, forms that have no name or measure because they came together on the other side of it all before wave became sound, before sound became word, before word became feeling, before hearts could break, before anything had begun or come to mean anything else. The song and in the unsung around it, the cry and in the uncried under it, better at any rate to not call this song. It is not for singing. Don't call this song. It's the infrawave of being. Don't call this song. It's the creature plants, the teacher plants, the mother plants, the warrior plants, the worker plants rising up. Don't call it song. It's the rising up. This unraveling, uprising into our hollow, each being emanating its own electromagnetic genius, wave upon wave, resonating with yellow, with berry, with chirisinango, with doe, with chuchuwasi, with anaconda, ant, crab apple, spider web upon web, spinning the unspun thinness of air, all gathered here, buzzing like gods, like cockroaches in the chambers of transmutation, the ecstasies of translation, returning the extravagance of the sun, pulsing with eight-minute-old frequencies, hitting now the photosensitive soul. Every image, a ghost given up. Every ghost, an image given off. You, your body, rose and released out of the Amazon where you said life grows on every surface. Life still here, three and a half billion years later, never gone, never eliminated, exterminated, extinct, but dying all the time, all the same, every animal kill in the rainwater, every frog, turtle, bamboo, rat, tunchi, paiche, anaconda, jaguar, toucan, isango, dust mite, you. 99% of all species ever, everything, dying all the damn time, and life just keeps on being life. Cellular, circadian, lit, but returning to darkness, to return from. Seeds, eggs, pods, wombs, caves, these darknesses life breaks out of and goes back into nightly, seasonally, perennially. Regeneration, the source is lightless. Reimmersion, the source is always lightless. Under the canopy, below the spring, the cave, the whole corpus cavernicum, never can the source be seen, known. For how else can it become itself? Rise into its own being, undetermined, surprising, becoming you and you and you. And you, and you, and you, and you. The French have left their way of saying. Marked that spot on the map, Belle Alliance. Beautiful joining, beautiful friendship. Branch and bramble bound up. Verdant greenery. Summer swelter in which we swim, in which we simmer. We are across the street in a large truck. Grandma Cadella won't get out of the truck. She won't say why. She won't say anything other than no. Won't turn her head. We go anyway. We climb out of the truck. What we find? Remnants of a house, a church. Behind the church and on the land, an old and overgrown graveyard. My grandmother's mother is buried there. Her grandmother is buried there. Her father is buried there. Grief, grief grown rooted and wild. Grief everywhere like dirt. Grief stem, grief piston, grief root, grief leaf, grief tendril, grief blossoms. Her sitting spoke to grief, her refusal to be moved, her unmoving sweat through us. There was confusion. Stem, root, piston, tendrils of grief unmoved. The spot on the ground makes for the grief in which we simmer. The truck takes you to the know of all grandmas. What is in the remnant? in the revenant.
parentheticalities. This is an essay, by the way. So we're kind of switching modes a little bit, a lot. Parentheticalities, or how I came to be. When I moved to New York, Mm -hmm. I can see this. this When I moved to New York, to the New York tri-state area, after years of living in the flat and minimally sidewalk land of Houston, Texas, an idea of love trounced momentarily MFA pursuits. It was the mid-90s before iPods and the absorbing ubiquity of smartphones when Sony Walkmans were the technological rage and I had already been writing and reading with writing in mind for years. In those early, still unemployed stranger days as we, that socio-temporal collectivity, each eye is forced to inhabit and navigate, mastered the art and technologies of being alone together. I walked around Brooklyn. I, living at the time in Boston, had seen Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing in 1989 when it premiered and knew something I thought imagined via Lee of Brooklyn along the Fulton Mall, listening to the cadences of what and who was around me. The Brooklyn soundscape was an early introduction to life in the New York I had imagined living in since I was a girl, pronounced too skinny in certain quarters because nobody likes a bone but a dog, who imagined a host of elsewheres for the southern, not southern enough sounding person that I have always been. At home as a girl when I spoke, I was often asked, where are you from? as though Nolens hadn't trained my tongue and ears at the sonic, cadenced, and cellular levels. I speak with the rhythms and cadences of my young mother, youngest daughter of the youngest daughter of a Nolens born daughter of a woman and man sold into the area via Congo Square, one of the public spaces from which they were to be excluded along Bayou St. John, called La Place Congo, where enslaved and free Africans from a range of cultures and languages given under Code Noir Sundays off, living in 18th century Louisiana under Spanish and then later French colonial governance, gathered. According to the description of one writer, the African slaves meet on the green by the swamp and rock the city with their dances, bodies, and their rich melange of languages and accents and the drumming that would roll out across time and circumstance. A south of the south lollygagging in language and rhythm and possibilities and realities of encounter. I speak with the voice, the rhythms of my mother, descended daughter, reading poetry to me, in my head, in my heart, in my day-to-day -day going. It is the ever-present baseline in my work. Make of the sorrow a dirge, soundscape is territory of the bone rattles. Make of the sorrow a tango, you and what is an I without a home is a girl who speaks in you beside, inside its minor trained tongues, details, discipline, wombs. Every source has its own source, rolling out across circumstance, lollygagging in the rhythm of my mother in the day-to-day -day going. 
during the Brooklyn fall when I needed and need was a sheltering and constant during that and perhaps during each time of arrival. And yes, a poem is a moment of arrival, of becoming. When I needed to walk and to feel as though I had a place, I was couch surfing to which I might claim belonging or potential belonging or temporary belonging, I listened to two cassettes on switch and repeat. Anita Baker's 1986 album, Rapture, and Sarah Vaughn's at Mr. Kelly's, recorded live in 1957 Chicago. It was fall 1994, eight years after Rapture was produced, 39 years after at Mr. Kelly's, when I drove a two-axle U-Haul truck into lower Manhattan to a storage facility and then on to Brooklyn. I had played Olita Adams' rendition of New York State of Mind loudly over the truck's radio as I drove into New York. It was a song I queued up for the symbolic announcement of arrival, transition, and a feeling. The mood and the mind was where the body was heading, and music marked and tracked, and on some other planes motivated the movement, inspired the mood. There is something of the thought-known, churchified, black Southern Baptist home that Adam's voice intones for me, and that thought-known home with distinct variations courses through the sonic configurations that emerge in Vaughn's and others, and then Baker's and others' musical renderings. The past is omnipresent and is predictive, possibly sometimes, of possible futures to be and to suppose. There is as much meaning and feeling in phrasing, in the how and cadence of saying, as there is in the what. It was in October, and I drove I-10 East from Houston to New Orleans with my sister C in the passenger seat. We were pulled over by a Texas state trooper who strode from the back of the car along the passenger side, standing a ways away as he peered through the passenger windows and motioned and yelled his instructions to me. He unlatched the holster of his sidearm as he walked more clearly into view, his hand hovered just above the still holstered gun as he barked his instructions to make the point that I must obey. Non-compliance is a deadly proposition for many. Codes of grammar and speech regulate with remarkable brutality what and who goes where. Codes of conduct are read differently depending on the embodied circumstance. It was late night on a dark stretch of road. My sister and I were young, black, and unaccompanied women alone in a rented truck loaded with all of my belongings, pulling my Mazda 626, I love that car, mm -hmm. <laughs> on a trailer. Before the moment of our trip, we'd been singing along to tunes on the radio, to songs on the cassette player, singing words and tunes we knew by heart, music we'd learned growing up, tunes that populated the rhythm of our life experiences and expectations. We had been laughing sisters after a protracted day of packing finally underway. Our laughter, our goodness, our law-abidingness, our education, our love, our Christianity, our joys, our potential provided no respite, no reprieve, no unfettered passage from there to there. Now my mother would say, God kept us, this is grace. Her sense of grace becomes the single shield. Flashing lights, sirens, the threat of an unlatched gun readily accessible. Where are you going? Why? Why now? Why this time of night? As though he needed me to justify and explain the wheres, the what, whens, the whys of our black existence in that or any space and time on that stretch of highway, I-10. He had motioned for me to get out of the truck, demanded that I climb down and go around the front of the truck to the passenger side where he stood with his hovering hand and gun and then walk back with him to his waiting patrol car. 
my sister, as I looked at her through the windshield and the passenger window, looked worried, mouthed, what? What does he want? I don't know what he wanted. I only know what he did because he could. Desire is often the well-heeled daughter of impossibility. He asked to see, though the problem is a matter of the construction of their, which their, inner eyes, those eyes with which they, not all the theys are identifiably white, look through their physical eyes upon reality. My license, my car's registration, and the rental agreement for the U-Haul. What would this tell, see, or sense him? Of course, I knew even then that our blacknesses, our black skin, our black personhoods are, were clocked by this official as criminal, in fact, or always in potential, as always already suspect and suspicious, as not women in the meta narratives of gendered figures to be protected, as black women in the meta narratives of gendered and raced figures to be constantly policed pulled over, questioned. He wanted the story that would explain me in some acceptable way. The acceptable is often the mirror behind which the unacceptable stands in waiting. In tears, I'm against public crying, which most of you who know me know. In tears, I'm against public crying. I question the trooper's legitimacy as he rifled through my papers and ran them through whatever system he had access to. Why are you doing this, I asked. I asked how I was supposed to know that he was who he claimed he was. I told him that he could be anyone. I explained that I didn't know who he was and that I had never seen a Texas state trooper uniform before. Told him that a few years before, I had been abducted and assaulted by some other uh, white man waving a badge and a gun and claiming official capacities to detain and question me. Didn't, would never tell him that I was also well aware of the other recurring histories, of the other narratives that made those like him official and otherwise, some whom I knew, some whom I didn't know, a danger, especially to those like me, whom I may or may not know or know of. I hadn't been made aware of how stereotypes, I had been made aware of how stereotypes might be used against me as threat and by me as defense. On that strip of road, I cried. Though I don't believe in public displays, used as they so often are as proof of what we, which we, are not. As they are often used to disqualify varying us's from a host of rights, who legislates the rights, the wrongs? When our, who is this our rights, our presences, our going about our lives, our annoying inconveniences to the meta narratives which animate and regulate of what's going on at any given time? I began to hyperventilate as I recalled to for him the other threat and attack that I had survived. Trauma drama feeds the beast like music calms. Calmly and coldly, the supposed trooper asked where and when this assault had happened to me. He wanted, again, desire, details, as though the details of geography and chronology and of crime, and of the crime, were more significant evidence than the uncalled for terror of his traffic stop in that moment. I had to remember, call up my A vulnerability. Tears and trembling flash the wounds in order not to be perceived and shot. Hunching over made me a smaller target as a threat, even as I was being threatened. 
So often they fought like Aunt Hannah, who thought cat shit was banana. Never speak with a mouthful of crap, lest you be the problem. All the things that are supposed to save you make a list. The lists will save us. <laughs> on that strip of road, she cried, what attacks, what beast, what assault goes on at any given time? What is in the holster of the state? Who fits in the holster of the state? What goes in the holster of the state? And a monopoly on legitimacy, that is what is in the holster. The holster holds history, the holster holds rights. Make him not stand, make him kneel, please, and lick solemnly the white dividers down the highway. Make that happen. After this encounter, my and my sister's moods changed. After tears and measured rage, we had to get where we were going. My gentle sister and I talked about NWA's Fuck the Police, a 1980, 90, sorry, 1988 tune that had sparked late 1980s outrage among the respectable, a tune to which we, my sister and I, had until that moment given very little thought. We tried to call up the lyrics to a tune that we paid little to no attention to. We knew the refrain and the beat that it held in travel. We had to improvise our own lyrics, make up our own outcry, make of the sorrow, the rage, the discomfort, the possibility a song. Make the sorrow swing. Those swings echoes through an ugly beauty, strange fruiting us into attentive and discomforting listening, being. After New Orleans, I drove I-285 to Atlanta and I-95 from Atlanta to Washington, D.C., and finally on to New York with light, bright, damn near white A, a friend of my lighter than a paper bag, Cousin T, as my passenger. There were no other official officiating stops along the way <coughs> except to pay the toll as we entered Manhattan. In 1994, Baker's Rapture was the cassette tape I had owned the longest. I had allowed myself to splurge on it during a relatively impoverished and extravagant student year in Germany, a year during which I studied the German language and American literature weirdly. In one class, a writing by American women um, I was introduced to something. And I'm just going to skip to the end, actually. I can't feel the of this. Three decades separate Sarah Vaughn's. <coughs> Excuse me. Three decades separate Vaughn's at Mr. Kelly's <clears throat> and Baker's Rapture albums. Yet something in the performances, specifically Baker's runs, and according to the New York Times, <coughs> bold improvisations, swooping, gliding phrases, and Sarah Vaughn's remarkable scat singing, left with me a sense of that homeness in a strange place. I could be anyone, I thought. At any time, I could be many ones. I could be alive, vibrating always on the edge of legibility to myself and to those I love. No worlds or two worlds of indifference, possibility and invention, singing of what was behind me and of what might have been behind me, and of what might yet be, and of what is and isn't. Something in the affective registers of their voices, the registers of the music, notes bent and held or reaching toward and after, a standing in 
and an escape to and from felt familiar and grounded and lifted me as I walked, as I explored, as I encountered, as I was, or as I might yet become. My work as a writer comes from so much. And from you. Second line. Second line. So, I am word on the street as I'm from New Orleans. <laughs> or at least that's the word I put on the street. <laughs> Whatever street there is. But, um, so one of the things about funerals, like, and I've said this to people, if I die, I want a second line. <laughs> I want a serious second line. Part of what, you know, like, the whole dirge to the funeral. I want all the weeping. Y'all can tear your clothes, whatever you got to do. <laughs> but on the way back from the grave is this joy, right? That is a celebration, kind of. There's the, the sort of dark part of me that thinks, it's the, wow, that ain't me. <laughs> and there's the, oh, yes. You know, another moment of life. So we want to invite you to write. Um, in response to that, and what we'd like you to write is your second line poem. You'll have seven minutes to write the dirge and the... Yeah, you're going to write the second line poem, the whole part of it. <laughs> yeah, that's the That's the thing. Well, I, that's why I was trying to talk about what it is, right? So I'm not is talking about the lines. Of the people coming out. Oh, so people are coming out, going, there's a processional carrying the casket to the grave. And there's a line of people. And there's the line that comes back, the second line, right? Which is a kind of dancing. And it's not frivolous. It's the joy that recognizes that death is in it, too. And so is the return. Yes. So that's what I mean by it. Okay, you'll have seven minutes. I will set the timer. And please go ahead and write.
One more minute. <coughs> So we'd actually like to invite you to share what you've written and we'd like to kind of converse with you in the way that we were talking with each other. So if you wish. If you yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see, because you think you won't be heard? You so sure? can we give you the mic? No. Yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to? Well, just give it to people. You, right. Can we see? You got it. Okay. In the return, there is return from the space of light to the darkness we came from. The dance floor at 4 a.m. when Detroit came to town and we lost our minds for a three second moment. Why did they turn on the light? As if in a print song, we needed to see ourselves in the ugly light. The concrete beneath your feet tells me you know I'm okay. That the smell of my neck and the catalyst for your joy the joy is the wrong word, is infinite. Don't forget to dance and to take your shoes off when you get home.
Thank you. Give yourself up to this holiness of breath, the pulsating and kick, the red wheel of life. She said she wanted this. She wanted life and nothing more, life and nothing else. Hear the music of her bird song. She listened for it in the trees and the ocean waves. Everywhere her, er, her ears perked at the possibility. Her father's declaration, life was an echo in every day. Don't worry about forgetting. Forgetting is the body's way of going on. And this going, this what's going on is the refrain of everything. Circling, circling, fire and earth, water and time. The water is a wheel and so is time. But if you want to honor her, don't be afraid to dance. Dance and shake as if, as if no one can top this. Top off your day with this umbrella shaking. Life, generation. I tell my son when I'm gone, you'll remember me saying, life, hear it, and tell it to your child too. That's all I need in this, all I need, all I ever needed was the song, the song, the song. Cycle in, cycle in, head up straight, straight ahead, step by step, step forward, step forward destination reached. Turn, turn around, feet firm to the ground. Feet tingle, tingle with earth energy. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. My weight carried through the streets grows lighter the closer we get, even as the steps are slow and the dirge arcing skyward with heavy notes makes a bridge of stone, an earthly bridge. You'd think I'd feel the sink as they lower me down, reverberate through my still changing cells, but instead I lift like backwards rain, returning to the clouds my moisture on a fresh updraft. As my mourners turn, their feet are light, my particles still lifting out. Don't mourn my bones, but feed the soil they enrich with time. You can sing, carry me out on your song, and your feet, turn your feet towards each other, unafraid of what's to come, and laugh because it is given to you, and you can. Look on this earth with mortal eyes, and bless this day in its endless procession. Okay, I warned you. <laughs> um, melt the fog and beat your drums. I lived on Pepto and cut my teeth on Tylenol. Feel my pain. Be sad, sad, sad that you'll miss my quips and tears. My mom wants 99 Luft balloons to play at her funeral, and I think I want to start with Black Sabbath and end on Beyonce. <laughs> Scream out. Dance hard, eat a plate of figs and honey, lap by the river, get your pussy or bussy or thussy eaten, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> at my funeral, <laughs> and don't say I heard, don't say I never did anything for you, <laughs> <laughs> or lap up the sun and joke with a friend, cry blood oranges and vomit gay glitter. <laughs> The dirge. They worried about cremation, that the stuff of their being would not return into the earth to become one millionth of a million different beings, but instead disappear in one short blaze of flame, the afterlife gone in a moment shorter than the life. But by the end, it didn't matter. What they had feared was that somehow through fire, their matter wouldn't return to the world. A silly thought, how on earth could they have exited the world? 
the joy, when the hips start moving, and how can they not, when the pocket is this deep, when the swing is so rolling, when the rhythm is so stretchy, the harmony is so looping, the hips trace a figure eight, one diagonal, a turn, the opposite diagonal, a turn, tracing infinity, tracing out the infinite, there is no end to the dance, we're always coming around the turn, or down the diagonal, now, and now, and now, and now. Um, she, that me, let that ground carry flowers, hellebores, heliotrope, wisteria, springs, hysteria, and heartbreak. Lilacs do it, old roses, names you can't pronounce. Yes to brass, yes to shake your ass on that road, out into that forest, to the sea, to the tide pools that are a lure. You can't touch, but you can look. You're the camera, you're the characters in the stories, become any of them, many you are the audience, and you've been invited in. Eater and pull back. Slip into my mouth. My mouth holds you, tastes your saltiness, and you free to dissipate with me. My father was a swarm of bees landing in my sister's yard. I'll be that late flower, past bud and bloom into disarray, fallen, petals plastered on dirt and stone, and for another year, seed for another year. The very waiting it holds, releases, scatters, disperses, diffracts, defibrillates, and does, and does, and has done. <clears throat> what is this breaking of expansiveness, the rich moment lasting, but working towards a far-reaching dullness? I would call it fury but I would also call it response, the construction, the final draft, last looks, everyone, last looks, the curtain is rising. Mine's a bit more prosy, but anyway. <laughs> I can't control the return, but when I leave, I love to leave alone, and those who wish to leave together can. But I wish for those who would like to leave alone, quiet, just empty. And for those who would like to leave joyous, raise a glass and say, thankfully he's gone. Let's get going and watch a movie for him. Sinking lower, sinking below, lower, moisture, roots, life. I can still breathe. It seems normal. It feels, it feels, it feels. I feel myself extend, at first slowly, discovering the terrain. It's soft, hard, then soft. I shoot across a galaxy of space to the fire temples. Ancient futures, it feels like home. <laughs> Eucalyptus rained, stained the ground, the floor of you, door of you. Mooring us at this harbor, all of us, like trawlers and whalers named Quandry or Savage or Maui Sun. Remember the lost sailor on a pedestal, now backed by that translucent, rainwashed blue, whose fish fed the hungry and the satisfied, fishermen and women lost to the tides. I tried to hold him. I 
tried to hold him. The water so cold, his red cheeks reeking of the morning's alcohol, the boats rocking, just barely, in rows anchored in her docks, clouds unclouding the sky. Our hands, too, were cold, like his shredded ones. I tried to hold him, he said again, and then there you were, like a crabber in the icy Alaskan sea, as savage and tender, as savage and tender as I remembered you. You're good? No, I don't know about this I'm good thing. <laughs> the dirge is, the word is crossed out. Nobody needs to write the dirge. Nobody writing it all the time, writing it all the time out of needing to. Second line, curving shifts back again. Front forth, breath brought, to, with, from, around, among, on, in underneath. Second line. Here lies old Laura. We called her that for the ripe old age she lived to in good health. Known for her poetry and being nice to children, she was often to be found in the park contemplating the cherry blossoms falling. Her own fall from life was like a cherry blossoms. One day, she was limberly doing yoga and going swimming. The next day, she didn't wake up, but was found like a petal, head on her pillow, having long since been interviewed for her longevity tips. Okay, this is your last chance, all of you. That's cool. All right, we'll send Before I see. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for sharing that with us. This is what has, is left, um, or, or the traces, the echoes, the second line of the second line on the screen behind us. Um, this is a practice that Tanya and I kind of developed over a few months of working together through the pandemic. And it's much harder to do it on Steve's computer. <laughs> Your mouse is so hard. We're just getting used to his whole whiteboard thing. Also, the whiteboard. I don't understand your whiteboard. Yeah, it shows. <laughs> but... Um, it's something. It's something we developed over. It's right. It was during the pandemic, and it was out of how do you engage across distance? How do you think together? How do you write together? And if there's an idea that um, well, there are several things I'm thinking about, like what does this practice mean? This series, and this is the second time it's happening is called Undisciplining the Fields. And I'm really interested in and sort of committed to an idea of intellect, intellectual and creative practice that <laughs> even as our discussion or our presentations are held in institutions, that we not be institutionalized. And so that we talk about the ways of making and being <laughs> that impact what we do. <laughs> there are a few more. Um, and so I'm thinking you're an anthropologist, you've been a filmmaker, you are a filmmaker, you're a producer, um, you're a writer, you were momentarily a sous chef. 
<laughs> I think that should be in every part of your, <laughs> your bio, but um, what is undisciplining for you? What does it mean for you as a, yeah. You knew that part was coming. You made me read stuff, so you're gonna have to answer questions. <laughs> um, but what is that? What does it mean for you? And how do you draw on the work you do as an anthropologist and filmmaker and organizer Oof. and writer? You know, it, it's. Hmm. I guess I knew this was coming, but it, 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 it's, 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 like, it's like we've gone through so much in this hour, and now we have to theorize it. Um, or not even theorize. Think about, yes, no, you're right. It, uh, have, just have a conversation, a lamentation. <laughs> <laughs> the discipline. Lamentation. Undisciplined. <laughs> I mean, it's everything, for me, it's everything that you said, the institutions that we've inherited, right, and the contradictions they have and, and the disciplines that have grown inside them are problematic for reasons that we can explore. People probably have some of their own, or maybe, maybe they don't, but some of us feel they're problematic. Um, not just because they have borders around disciplines, but because the very kind of foundation of these institutions, the epistemic premises, um, their history of fundings and land takeover, so, you know, the political and the epistemological field, don't allow for all kinds of knowledge and practices to enter as valid forms of producing effects in the world. Um, and <clears throat> the audience always, or for the most part, the audience of in any university setting ends up being primarily, or often ends up being the university. In other words, the university requires your reputation to grow mm -hmm. in order for the university to grow its reputation. And your reputation grows by, you know, having these wonderful people in the room, but, you know, all these ways, by having citations, different disciplines have different ways of growing the reputation. And it, maybe in itself it's not a bad thing, but it does become part of the extractive uh, direction, part of the extra extractive ways in which universities work, which is not about, I mean, here it's about us being, I mean, there's a lot of friends here, so it seems hard to just keep saying that again because, you know, I love you all. But, but, you know, it, it's, not, it's often not making that kind of community and relation that we are making. It's often about, you know, having the big name, having the... And so there is, there is for me, undisciplining is also very much about moving away as much as I can to, while surviving and getting my salary and so on in the institutions, but moving away from the economy of reputation, the circulation of creativity as, or knowledge as a commodity form that ends up on your resume, on your website, on your social media, on likes, on all of those measures, right, that accrue to you, but also by, you. I mean, they're required by the, by, by the institution. So for me, undisciplining is, yes, doing all of this free play, doing, of course, rigor is, is, so rigor is another part of discipline, which I like. Well, and discipline is also, right, <laughs> the, dis, the disciplinarity, the sort of, yeah. that disciplines are about not only structuring fields of knowledge, but determining what exists and matters outside of it. So the very things that when we talk about I don't know, social justice, for instance, we're, we're talking about ways of organizing law and order, ideas of justice, um, that the university, writ large, has largely been a part of realizing. So, <laughs> yeah. so what is it to say, 
well, wait a minute. What if the discipline isn't exactly, or the relationships are, I don't know, those kinds of, <laughs> that it's like, oh, I remember sitting at your kitchen table mm -hmm. and you were making something or I was talking about something and that is as vibrant uh, a means of producing knowledge and, and as rigorous mm -hmm. and as significant as anything else. And that when I think of what has occurred here, that there's a way we've all produced this, these various pieces of things together, right? And in relation to each other. And so something for me that is um, incredible about the practice and it, interesting to me about what you do, what you do at 427, what you do in your own work is that there's a constant questioning of what are the boundaries that we cross and what do those boundaries have to do with how we live. There's an ethics to it. Yeah, I, mean, I try to not lose sight of that. I mean, it's also, you know, something I think, wow, where else would you go and derive a salary out of thinking and writing? You know, so, so yeah, there's, a, there's a way, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, my paycheck. I, I was just thinking this month. <laughs> but so there's a way in which you kind of balance what it offers and, you know, and, and, and try and change it and stake more ground and, and, and import the ethics and the politics into the institutions that are kind of resistant to it. And maybe it will never be the kind of place that, you want it to be. It'll never be the kind of discipline that you would want it to be. Um, but it's it's also some of the ground that we have, and we kind of don't want to give up give it up entirely. Maybe, and we've talked about this, right? Am I going to leave? Am I not going to leave? All all of those kinds of questions. There's a part of me that's always like, well, I mean, escape is always one way, but but how do you make room instead within something that's problematic? Because you're not you're not going to find you know, the utopian discipline out there, uh, necessarily. So, so, you know, how do you, how do you make room here by doing this kind of gathering, by bringing people like you have here? Well, and by making work in this way. I mean, what mm -hmm. is it to not have the solitary hero, but to continually imagine that um, I am because you are. I am only in the company of we, um, and that that's the, that's the state for all of us, no matter how much we claim otherwise. But there's also a weirdness and a danger to that claim, right? Um, <laughs> part of the danger maybe has to do with ownership, has to do with an impulse in, hmm, I'm not going to criticize my country. I know, and then I said my, mm -hmm. uh, which is about <laughs> ownership. I know, I know. Um, and then all of a sudden, you got to tell all my business. <laughs> um, no, I'm just thinking, what is the, um, we're, we're told to, that our value is determined by distinguishing ourselves mm -hmm. as a singular individual who rises mm -hmm. up and gets prizes and gets prizes and acknowledgments and those things, um, how do we live otherwise? Yeah. I mean, you say, I mean, there's an economic question in there. This question of the salary that I brought. There's also a question of a, of, of another kind of discipline, which you know, I I don't mind discipline in that other sense of of the rigor of the training right discipline is a, is entering into a training bye thank you thank you for coming is entering into a kind of training right or uh, the same as disciple have you know following a line of doing a way of doing something learning and and i think of the dis disciplines of of the ego 
right? The ascetic disciplines, the disciplines that keep pulling you back from precise.